All right. We are going to start. First of all, I would like to thank everyone for attending. Thank you for battling traffic, battling parking, um, battling the crowds. Uh, I think we are, um, it's one of the greatest problems to have when you're victims of your own success. Uh, we will, um, we're, we're taking notes and um, we'll figure out logistics next year. We're at the convention center. But first of all, thank you for making it. Second, thank you for attending this wonderful session. Uh, we're going to talk about modernizing government. In fact, we're going to get really, really specific and talk about how, how to future-proof the government. So how to prepare the government for the new technologies that are coming out and make sure that they're not victims of their own success. So I'll start with an introduction. My name is Doug Van Dyke. I'm the general manager for the federal civilian and nonprofit verticals within Amazon Web Services. Um, the esteemed panel, uh, starting on this side, Michael Jenkins is the chief architect for the Victoria Information Network Exchange, also known as Vine. Craig Bauman, Verizon's managing direct director for cloud solutions. Elizabeth Pemeril, <laughs> thank you for the help, is the director of US public sector sales for GitHub. Rob Grote is the EVP of Technology and Strategy, Smartronics. So I think he got a promotion since the last time. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank Congratulations. You. Uh, hopefully it was due to all your work on AWS, the success that you've <laughs> no. had, and it's just escalating your career. We're going to have yeah, another absolutely. breakout on Rob later today, <laughs> how to elevate your career through using Amazon Web Services. Nice. Um, and then last but not least, Dave Rogers is the head of architecture and security for the Ministry of Justice. Uh, digital and technology. So first of all, thank you all panelists. Uh, I appreciate you all being here and especially those of you on the edge, risking your lives on the edge of this stage to, to be a uh, panelist. Um, so I'd, I'd like to start with each of you and I'm gonna go in reverse order. Dave, do you mind talking a little bit about what you're doing right now to help future-proof the government? No. Might have raised it up a little bit. Is that better? Yeah. Yes. Better. Yeah. yes. Okay. Um, so I work at the uh, UK Ministry of Justice. That's the uh, department in the UK that looks after courts, prisons, probation. Um, and what we're we doing to future proof government. Uh, I think when I was asked this question, the first thing that came to mind uh, was uh, skills and culture. So in order for us to, to um, build an organization that can continue to deliver effective technology uh, for a very long time, we've got to build a place where people want to come and work, um, uh, people want to bring their technical specialisms to government. Um, we need to, even though obviously one of the most complicated decisions when working in government is, is do I buy that? Do I buy something or do I bring a team? Do I build a team inside my organization to make something? Um, and what we're realizing is that it's a very important to build a team of technical specialists who are capable of building things inside government and that will actually give you the engine of the skills you need to buy things effectively as well. Um, and government will always do, be doing a blend of those two. Um, so in order to kind of, in order to attract those skills into government, I think government's got to get better at uh, raising its own profile. Uh, and it's, co it's competing in a marketplace with uh, tech companies, um, other sectors. Uh, government needs to be a really compelling place to work for people who work in technology, technology and digital. Um, I think maybe one of the areas where we're kind of quite uniquely positioned is uh, certainly within the UK civil service, there's uh, incredible support for diversity in the workplace. Uh, and I think there's maybe a responsibility for the public sector to take a lead on that um, and make it an incredibly attractive place for work uh, to, to work for people from a variety of different backgrounds um, while still being able to offer uh, a great place in terms of the technology people to get, get to work with as well. So Rob, thank you. Um, so Rob, you're one of those technology companies that Dave was referring to. How are you helping the government get prepared for the, with the new technologies that are coming out? Yeah, if you look at, uh, can you guys hear me okay? All right. Um, if, you, if you look at uh, Smartronics, we have a, a longstanding history of working with AWS and 
In 2009, we actually were the first company to help bring a federal web property onto AWS. So the things that I look at, I've seen, I've seen government transform over the last seven years and how they're embracing cloud technologies and really understanding how to do things with cloud technologies. And we've been trying to build capabilities around how do you provide that managed services capability mixed with the managed security services capability. And it's the security technologies uh, that are really driving and fueling the growth of cloud with our customers. Um, we work in a very heavily regulated and security compliance driven space. We've provided cloud services for several very large federal financial services customers, Treasury probably being one of the largest, not sure how many of you guys know, but treasury.gov is actually running on the AWS cloud. We operate and monitor those, uh, uh, those particular web properties. But we're really looking at how can you take some of the, the, the core primitives and new capabilities that AWS uh, is providing and how can you provide more of an automated security and compliance capability? I mean, one of the things with future-proofing is, is being able to handle the unknown. And certainly with the security posture and security risks and threats that are out there, you need those capabilities to kind of fold all of that in. And that's what we've, uh, that's what we've kind of been doing for the past few years is helping large federal organizations understand the transformation process, but purely focusing on the managed security capabilities that you can do within a cloud environment. One of the things that we actually will lead with, you know, seven years ago it wasn't like this. People would move to the cloud for cost reasons or they'd move for agility. Um, we're seeing that transformation be that you're moving to the cloud because of security. Um, and you're looking at moving your most sensitive workloads into the cloud. How do you build that foundational capability to move your most critical workloads into the cloud? All right, I'm going to pick on that a little bit more later um, before <laughs> I get there. Thank you, Rob. So, Elizabeth, if you want to buy something, you go to Amazon.com. If you want something for free, you go to GitHub, <laughs> right? <laughs> Including stickers, right? Including <laughs> stickers. I, I, yeah. That's right. Good afternoon. I'm Elizabeth. Uh, I'm a GitHubber. And uh, that's right. With, with my fellow GitHubbers on the public sector team, we help government agencies who are working with both GitHub.com, which is our uh, cloud platform, our SaaS platform, and GitHub Enterprise, which we deliver on-premises for agencies to use. And both really play an important role in future-proofing. When we talk about getting something for free, I think you're referencing the ooh, about 35 million different project repositories out on GitHub.com, which are available for open source collaboration. And this is where these open source technologies play such an important role marrying government work, government mission, with, with talent and with energy. Um, so to bring some of that development community uh, into the fold when it comes to government work is a really important aspect uh, as we look forward to, to what's next in the government space. And then in terms of uh, inner sourcing of using GitHub on premises, what we see very often are agencies interested not only to understand where their code lives, but why a decision happened, who made that change, uh, what discussions occurred, what documents and assets were created in the process. Um, so when we think about future-proofing government, I think there's another angle, which is let's make sure we know what we own, where it is, and, and why things happened, both for today's teams and for teams of the future. Thank you. So Craig, you can't use the cloud unless you connect to it. How does <laughs> Verizon solve that problem? So let me start by saying, anything I may say, take with a grain of salt. I've been with Verizon for about three months. <laughs> But I'll preface that came from Adobe before that, and that was a government engineer for about 18 years prior to that in the Department of Defense arena. So I come from the government side trying to figure out how to make sure that we don't build silos again, which is what we always did. So in the audience, if you're anything like me, you're probably somebody who's trying to get to the cloud and you're wondering how much should I move, which cloud should I go to, is it all Amazon? How do we make this work and how do we do it so that we don't have to put everything in there at once and how do we migrate over time? Uh, and I just know that because that's where I was as well. So I would say that the reason why I came to Verizon was I knew in making that transition that connectivity was gonna be key. We partner with Amazon because they've solved the big problem. They've solved the problem of how to create a global infrastructure where you can commoditize your data and you don't have to worry about where that data necessarily is. But underneath that is a connectivity need that we as Amazon and Verizon are very concerned about. And what I think is exciting about sitting up here is just two years ago we would have been considered strong competitors between Verizon and Amazon. 
And what Verizon did was very much what Amazon did, which is we looked at our global infrastructure and said, how do we provide tie-in points that allow customers like you to get into a close proximity connection point and through a private connection get right to Amazon so that you can access all of their data as if you were on their private network. And that is where we are spending a great deal of our effort is around a technology called SCI. It's Secure Cloud Interconnect. And it is a global network of private connections that allow you, the customer, to connect to Amazon's environment um, with a high level of quality of service and security. And that's going to ensure for future-proofing government that as you begin to build out your architecture, you're going to be able to do things that you weren't able to do before. Things like separating your colo and your Amazon cloud with such low latency that you can build apps that before latency would not have allowed you to do that processing. SCI is now going to allow you to do that, and you don't necessarily have to be in the da same data center. So that's the majority of where we're spending our time with Amazon and, and some of our investment. Thank you, Craig. Mm -hmm. um, Michael, can you tell us a little bit about Vine? How is Vine uh, future-proofing? Thank you. Um, so I'm Michael. Uh, I've come all the way from uh, Melbourne, Victoria, in Australia, and um, and our experience there has been, uh, I think, very relevant. We know a hell of a lot about um, future-proofing because we've done such a poor job of it in the past. <laughs> uh, so Vine is, a, uh, I suppose, an outgrowth of the emergency management um, sector of Victoria. We work across a, a variety of different departments and agencies within the state and also interact uh, federally and nationally in order to improve the safety and, and the, uh, the outcomes from communities affected by emergencies. So the biggest challenge that we've had in the past at least has been in building systems that, uh, that are not too expensive to establish, we don't have a whole lot of money, um, but also building systems that at a moment's notice will be available for a very wide number, or a very large number of users across the state. And so it's been, a, a, I suppose, a consistent and recurring problem that we've been building systems that seem to be designed well enough for our expected workloads but when we encounter the unknown or the extreme, uh, they've really struggled. So we've undertaken through our, um, our work with AWS to build systems that now are, are truly scalable and yet low cost. And when at rest, they, they cost basically nothing. But in the case of an emergency, they suddenly scale up to support the demands of uh, a million plus users. So really, the, the experience that we've had is about how to explain uh, within the sector, within the, the state, and within the nation, how AWS and other cloud services can change the way we look at designing and building and implementing emergency management and community, community information systems uh, to, to give us the capability of not just meeting what we understand that we need, but also providing solutions that previously we couldn't have even dreamed of rolling out because of the sheer infrastructure cost involved in building uh, a solution for the worst case. So we've been able to use AWS to introduce new services for, uh, for the responders, the first responders and the cooperating agencies that uh, are relatively compute intensive and, and require a significant amount of infrastructure, but which we only turn on to that level of, of use, 10% of the year perhaps. Uh, and in the past, if we'd approached that problem, we would have ended up building a, a very large amount of infrastructure that would have gone largely idle and basically been unaffordable. So as we, we share this message, message across the sector, we're finding a whole lot of new use cases. For example, uh, predictive services and fire prediction that we can now run with uh, massive, um, <coughs> massive diversity with the, the, the models, of quite sophisticated models. Uh, but we can run them for every, uh, every point of fire ignition uh, that we detect and for other types of emergencies on demand uh, using you know, 60, 80 cores, for example. But uh, in such a way that we couldn't previously have done it, simply because we have that infrastructure to draw upon. So can I pull on that thread? So you said this scales up to millions of notifications. Um, I, I see one of the challenges with existing government is the silos. And what you've done has to work not just within a single agency, but across all the agencies of the government. How did you tackle that challenge of building something that isn't just in a single agency, but cross agencies? Thank you. Um, so we actually started with the challenge of information sharing and interoperability across the, the sector. 
So the Victorian Information Network for Emergencies is actually the, effectively the information layer of this picture. Um, and in my role in the broader Emergency Management Victoria organisation, I have the, the responsibility not just to, to leverage that standardisation and interoperability platform, but also to build out the, the, the applications in individual agencies. <clears throat> so we started with standardising information uh, and exchanging information uh, between the different agencies and departments in the, in the government organisations which typically hadn't been very ready or, um, or willing to share their information with the other agencies because it was either too hard or too siloed or too lost within their organisations. So we've been able to raise that information up and distribute it out across the sector. And at the same time, that's uh, enabled these new applications that I mentioned, things that new applications that draw upon this, uh, this broader and more accurate and more effective information set to deliver community information in a more timely and more tailored way to the, uh, to the people affected by emergencies. Thank you. So I'm going to bounce around a little to keep you guys on your guard. Uh, I'm going to go down to Dave. So you were talking about um, you know, future proofing, and a lot of this modernization involves changing the skill set or the people. Can you talk a little bit about that, you know, what the transformation effort for the, the, the personnel aspect is? Sure. Um, so I think like uh, it was interesting you talk about kind of elasticity in the cloud and stuff and how useful that is to you. For, for me, um, the justice system isn't particularly elastic um, and really the, the killer, the kind of killer feature of the cloud for me is low latency automation of infrastructure because um, that's an enabler to things like continuous delivery and DevOps and that gives you your culture change. So if, you, if you've got a technology platform that enables something like DevOps in your organization, it enables people to be uh, putting new production systems into live environments, say, every, every few minutes. Um, it transforms the way that an organization thinks and works. Suddenly, um, security, uh, people focused on security have to think about more continuous practice. People thinking about compliance have mm -hmm. to think about things more continuously. Um, if you're, if you're involved in governance within your organization, uh, suddenly the future becomes um, less predictable because people want to change direction quite a lot when, they, when, they're, when they're doing things like agile and continuous delivery. Uh, and then financial planning becomes even more confusing. Uh, gone are the predictable cycles of you know, large scale technology outsourcing, which even though would commonly result in failure in government, it was a kind of predictable kind of failure. Um, everyone was in agreement that it, it, you know, certain things were going to happen by a certain date, um, even if they, even if historically, you know, we had a track record of not doing that very well. So you can see how that ripple effect of a simple low latency API call in AWS or other cloud providers is having this ripple effect, where everything starts to become more continuous, and people can be more reactive about how they plan projects, delivery, and so on. Um, and for me, that leads to, uh, it leads to a really fascinating situation where we're, which we're right in the heart of at Ministry of Justice right now, which is as you shift towards that new model, you will find that certain new skills come in and certain old skills become less valued or needed in less volume. Uh, so to give you an example, new skills, um, there's, a, there's an entirely new profession in government which only really emerged uh, around about a kind of early GDS era uh, to government digital service around 2012, which is called web, web operations. And it's effectively a new form of operational engineer who specializes in automation. Uh, they understand how to work with the fundamentals of public cloud. Uh, and that's actually now an established career path recognized by cabinet office in the UK government. Um, meanwhile, people who maybe have experience at delivering large scale IT programs uh, are likely to be in less demand. As we embrace Agile more and more, the, uh, the kind of long-scale planning is not a skill that's going to be required uh, in, in such numbers. So um, I'm going to take the, the end of that statement and pass it over to Craig. Craig, when we yeah. were talking uh, before this session started, you talked about, so you were talking about Agile development and how things are changing right now and you know, <coughs> planning for the short term. Planning for the short term may even be replatforming. So, how do you design and move workloads across platforms while making sure that you have integrity with security? Yeah, so I'm going to actually point to GitHub for a second. So, some projects in GitHub are changing the way that we're going to be engineering our networks. 
And I think that if you are in this business, you need to pay close attention to things like OpenFlow and the technologies coming out with SDN because that is going to be the future of how you start connecting different kinds of networks, different kinds of organizations. And you know, to your point about application development, it will change application development. This is a really exciting time. It's, you know, if you think about the burst of technology that's happened, you're going to see an entirely new shift of technology as we collapse the, the infrastructure in which we are working through GitHub projects so that developers will be, have full access from the application tier all the way down to the quality of service tier. That has never been possible in our lifetime. And so if you think about remote locations being treated as one entity, if you're wrapping those entities together in a certain function, like network function virtualization, the application developers will now have to change the way that they develop. They'll have to write security and quality of service into their applications. That has never been part of the application developer's lexicon. I know, I was an application developer for most of my life. So when you're writing code, security is the, is the afterthought. It's the, as it goes through the review process, somebody does a security check, all right? And quality of service is almost never written into the applications. It's one of those things when application developers get done, they go, yeah, why does your program suck? Well, oh, the network, right? It's the network. It's always the network. Well, now you're going to have control of the quality of service because of what's happening between companies like Amazon and, and Verizon and others where they're collapsing the way that we have access from the touch point or the endpoint, the, the wireless device, the IoT device, all the way down to the MPLS network. And it's through combinations of this kind of partnership where we're giving the government the tools to think differently about the way they're engineering their solutions so that they don't write themselves into a silo. But if everybody in this audience is not reading about that and not understanding what SDN is, we're bound to create the same problems we did before. So I would recommend just, if you're into this, go look up, there's a, a document that was just released for free. It's um, the Software Defined Networking Architecture Roadmap. Six or seven companies contributed to it. It was released last month. It's about 144 pages of technical documents. I recommend that you read it, even if you don't understand it, because it, you can think through how this is gonna change our industry. And security is going to be completely changed because we're not gonna be thinking about security in a silo. It's no longer gonna be physical security. It's gonna be totally logical security that spans 15 or 16 physical locations. So policy is gonna have to change. Compliance is gonna have to change. The way that we think about uh, gateways and borders are going to have to change. And so all of that's going to change as this becomes a collapsed uh, hyperscale environment. So Elizabeth, future-proofing the government. How many times have you heard, we can't replatform this, we, the person, the only person who understands this program has retired? Mm -hmm. So, or. Regarding COBOL. And, yeah, it's in COBOL, and other started, than Laverne Council, I started Council, in COBOL. I, in COBOL. I, I did too. So there's maybe the three same. of us, but I didn't put any comments in any of my COBOL programs. <laughs> I'm part of the problem. Um, there may be three of us out of the 4,000 here or 8,000 here today who understand what the COBOL program actually does, and, mm -hmm. and we may all be, you know, ready, ready to retire. Mm -hmm. So how does the government future proof? As, and COBOL is a relatively easy to read language. Languages are getting very succinct and brief and, and more complex. Mm -hmm. How do you make it future-proof? The person, it no longer requires the person who coded the program to make a change. There are two answers I can think of uh, immediately. One is let's not start from scratch. And we mm -hmm. see that now over and over, folks starting uh, with a code base that has been developed by somebody else. And maybe it was by another agency, maybe it was by a uh, teenager in another country that was playing around with some friends and published some code to an open source uh, repository. So starting with, with best of breed, with what's available, uh, is, is, a good, is a good place uh, to be at ground zero. And then from there, um, involving as many people in the process and making sure you're capturing, as I pointed out earlier, the decisions, the discussions, the trigger points that cause um, the, the, the project to really take life. So why did we go this route versus another route? And that's true, and that's true of code, it's true of documentation, it's true of, um, of policy. So involving many people as you can in the process as early as possible, 
um, not starting from scratch and, and capturing as much of it as you can and storing it someplace. It doesn't have to be fancy. Um, GitHub's one example, there are many. Excellent answer. So I am going to ask one more panelist question to Rob, and then I'm going to walk the microphone around. Um, I, you know, I find that the most interesting panel discussions are when you all are having a back and forth with the panelists. So right now, be thinking about the questions or a challenge. I love it when you challenge the panelists. How do you future proof? Or if you have an existing challenge that you're working on currently, how would they solve it? So Rob, I told you I'd get back to this automating security and compliance. What's the secret? Yes, I mean, listen to what everybody on this panel really talked about. You talked about continuous integration and continuous development and how that's changing the way that you're actually moving applications and data across environments. You're talking about code repositories and collaboration. You're talking about connectivity and, and how software-defined network is, a, is really a, a big component of all of this. And really, it's software-defined everything. You know, you hear people talking about infrastructure as code. We're seeing entire ecosystems as code, where you're looking at everything from moving data through an environment, moving software uh, logically through an environment, but engaging with the security folks early and defining those rules, and then taking those security rules and codifying that. Um, I'll, I'll give you some really good examples. You can, if you want to, you can use the primitives that AWS provides, and you could have programmatically event-driven security and compliance. Um, if somebody changes a security group that's impacting your VPC boundary, maybe they even elevated their privileged user access, you can not only get notifi notified right away, you can um, have a Lambda function get evoked that's actually going to rechange it back to the configuration drift. You can automate to make sure you don't have configuration drift. You can get transparency in everything that happens. With software-defined everything, not just software-defined networking, you can manage your entire environments in ways you've never thought of doing it before. You can automate compliance. You can enforce encryption at the, the disk level. You can enforce certificate management at the uh, transport layer. Um, you can make sure that only approved services are being used, that only approved images are being used. You have the, the greatest amount of uh, homogeneity that you could ever have in managing an environment. And you really start to treat everything as an API endpoint, and you put the security around that. And that's how you automate it. That's exactly what you do. You focus, you take all the best things about DevOps, and you make it part of security DevOps, and you bring the security people in, and they come in with expertise and rules and compliance-driven uh, requirements. Those get codified and automatically um, move throughout your entire environment. You know I'm, I'm passionate about this, and you hear me talking about it. In fact, I have a session tomorrow that talks about nothing but automated compliance. It sounds like it's a, a very boring session, but I assure you there's things that you can do with automating security and compliance that you haven't thought of before. And I think it's very important to future-proofing government. So what Rob, time is your what, session? Yeah, what, so that yeah. session's tomorrow. What, what time is your session and where <laughs> I, is it, Rob, I, for I, those I, interested parties? Um, Annie probably has the details, but I believe it's at 2 o'clock tomorrow. 2 o'clock. Um, but it really is. It's a session on automating security and compliance and how that's changing the viewpoints from how, talk about transformation of people, how the, the, the natural order of people, security people are the ones that always say no, right? That's kind of in their nature. It's, it, we know this. Um, bringing them into the fold and showing them the realm of possibilities of what you can do with automation to enforce security and compliance. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you for the, the initial, there we go. Thank you for the initial round of questions. Now, I've got a list of questions, but they're canned questions. They're less interesting <laughs> and dynamic. So who in the audience wants to be the brave first soul to challenge this group of experts on future-proofing the government? Anyone? Going once. Bueller. Oh, 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 everyone's hands go up. OK, all right, we've got a, and the front row, too. You get to, like double points today, extra credit. So one of the things we consider when we're looking at new solutions is vendor lock-in. So when mm -hmm. you're thinking about your future, are you going to build something that could move from AWS to Azure or back and forth, or should you really just go all in and use all of those solutions? Or how would you consider that? And this is Victoria from Blackstone. from Blackstone. Now I have my answer, but I'll let you guys. <laughs> so did you hear that? So when you're architecting your solution at the beginning, do you architect using you know, do you architect for you know, knowing that you could replatform? Mm -hmm. Anyone? Yes. 
Yes, absolutely. I think that's great. And one thing I've seen more and more is that being a baseline question when we're talking to an agency as they're considering how they're going to structure their solution. You know, okay, we understand GitHub is based on Git. It's a good start. But what exactly will you do in a future situation if we wanted to make this type of movement? So asking those questions from the start, I'm two thumbs up. Absolutely. Just real quick, I, I think it's one of the reasons why you're seeing container-based technologies being mm -hmm. more widely adopted, adopted as a platform for uh, being able to move across environments. But I will caution you that if you're looking at building something and you want to make it work in a multi-cloud environment or a hybrid cloud environment, you're typically choosing the lowest common denominator and you're missing an opportunity to optimize your capability that resonates well with a particular cloud provider. Um, it's, a, it's a tough decision. But I would really balance out what the cost of replatforming is versus the capability that you can get by going all in with a particular cloud provider. And there's still ways to do this in, a, in an open fashion, how you build things in these environments, you know, utilizing Chef or Puppet or some recipe-based capabilities that can still allow you to, to, to use the advanced features of the cloud provider. But really, when you look at, at, at lock-in, you're also looking at limitations. I think, um, <clears throat> Something I'd add to that is oh, wrong mics. something I'd add to that is uh, I think there's a common perception that being able to move between cloud providers is something that we should aspire to and something that is quite possible. Um, in my experience, it's incredibly expensive. Uh, it's and it often it often doesn't it doesn't warrant the the actual move from from A to B. Um, and I think there's a really I think a, a common perception I, I see within government is that uh, a lot of senior people perceive uh, cloud as something that has become super standardized. Uh, it, it's a kind of, it's a socket, it's a commodity uh, where I can unplug it from here and plug it over there. And I think a, a lot of the challenges I face is trying to persuade people that it's not that commodity yet. I mean, there are open standards everywhere for different dimensions of cloud, um, but it's actually incredibly challenging to move between providers. Yeah, I would just say that uh, I think that the trend that we're going to see, I agree with everything everybody said, right? Sim simple is cheaper, simple is easier. Complex is hard, complex creates risk. But the reality is we're going to be in a hybrid environment for a while. All right? And Gardner, I won't speak for Gardner, but I think you're going to see, and most of the things Gardner comes out with, um, most companies, unless you're a startup and you can start in AWS, most companies are going to have multiple providers of like Office 365, Salesforce, SAP, Amazon for all your apps, um, Oracle if you're heavy Oracle users, because they're creating services around their cloud that are they're optimized in their environments. And I think that's just the reality of the cloud environment as it is today. Um, would I like it if everything ran in AWS with all the features of all the providers? And I could go, you better believe I would. Uh, but that's the reality. And so the question becomes, what do we do in order to be able to work in that environment? Because that's the way we're going to be working, right? It's, it's going to be a spectrum of cloud versus do you make one choice? And for, for us, what we advise our clients is try to think of the data packages and the flow of data as being the most important thing. Because whatever happens to the clouds, if you have been focusing on the data packages and the flow of data, you will be able to re-divert the flow in the packages in the future, and you won't be locked in to one vendor. Um, because putting everything in one vendor, right? if you can do that, which I don't think there are many that can, then it is optimal. But most of us are stuck on the other side, where we have 80% of our stuff as legacy that we can't easily move, and the cost of migrating is so high that even if we did, the cost savings would take us 40 years to recoup the cost. And so we're stuck in this sort of hybrid environment, even though we don't want to be. And so those who control the flow of data control everything. So you just take a look at where your data needs to go. Think of security that way. Think of optimization that way. And then you can look at where's the best place to put all of your new apps which clearly is Amazon, and make sure you put yourself Thank in Thank you. I think I owe you a dollar every time you yeah. say that, right? So, uh, and so just make sure that you do that, that you optimize where, you know, where, the, where, the, you know, where the product and the, and the endpoint uh, data package is best optimized for. Uh, I might just add something there as well. Um, agree everything everybody else has said. That's great. Uh, going to more than one cloud provider is very expensive, very difficult, lots of skills required. Um, the, the governance and the, uh, the auditing and the, the security controls are all very difficult, but sometimes you need to consider it, right? I don't start from the basis that we need N clouds. I start from the basis we need one for any given solution. But it's uh, extremely useful to be able to have a backup, a DR, a, 
a, re a redundant separate uh, implementation of your solution in some cases. And we've certainly found that in emergency management Victoria from a just a, a having to absolutely be able to rely on the provision of a particular service in the case of an emergency. Amazon's very good. You can build very, very fault tolerant, very highly available systems, but you still have a single vendor risk. And so in those cases, we do need to consider, do we go with a hybrid solution? Do we go with a multi-cloud solution? And that's when we have to accept that there's going to be an additional cost in the, the workloads, in the, in the skills, in the management for those particular types of solutions. If I could just add one thing to that. So, sure. yeah, just the, what he's talking about too, and think about Australia's got this, I mean, there are gonna be compliance and security and data sovereignty issues that restrict you from going to one cloud, even if you wanted to. So that's the reality that we're facing, is this is, we're not in a mature state of cloud yet, but boy, have we come a long way in a short amount of time. And so, if you just start the premise that, you, you know, unless, like I said, unless you're a startup and you can start in the cloud and stay in the cloud, most people will not be able to move totally in the cloud. So we really do have to think of what does rings of security look like in a hybrid environment, in a multi-cloud environment? How does SDN play into that? How, you know, how does the compliance around multi-clouds even work with when you're talking to a security group of wonks, right? So you have to go in thinking that's the way you're going to be because I doubt very many people can migrate their entire infrastructure into one cloud. Just as I just haven't seen it happen. See, it just got real, Victoria. Thank you for the first <laughs> question from the audience. I saw some other hands go up earlier. Was there? Oh, okay, front row. <coughs> Do you mind starting with your name? Where you where you from? Sure. I'm Brian. I'm with Real Cloud, and my question is with regard to applications. So I'm curious to know what type of legacy applications you run into most in the government. Those things like COBOL that need to be upgraded. What's the biggest headache? What's the most common thing for those of you that are involved in managing government applications? Um, I like answering that one. Uh, it's Microsoft Access. <laughs> what? <laughs> Microsoft <laughs> Access. Uh, it, uh, this is a bit of a kind of, uh, I keep bringing this up all the time. I find it quite fascinating. Uh, we've, got, we've got thousands of little access databases all around, all around government that are used for you know, localized data storage, uh, basic features for interacting with the database, basically where the funding never ever would have been channeled for someone to build something mature uh, and acceptable, you know, a, a normal kind of line of business application that we might expect. Um, and I still find that problem quite fascinating in government because um, no one's ever solved that. There, there's still that problem where there's a kind of, there's a kind of a, a, an amateur software engineer in everyone and, and if problems get complicated enough, they start to solve them themselves. And it either starts being incredibly elaborate Excel spreadsheets or it leaks over into Microsoft Access. But I'd say that's where most software engineering in government is actually happening. It's actually happening on the periphery in the shadows where people don't realize it's happening, which I find quite interesting. Uh, I think I'd add to that, um, or maybe detract from that, I'd just say Microsoft. Um, now, not being you know, too flip here, but uh, generally the biggest trouble we have in moving workloads into the cloud has been uh, heavily or particularly overly complex Windows-based applications. Um, generally speaking, the, the solutions that move easily are, are Linux or open source, and the ones which are difficult are legacy applications written on a, on a Windows platform with SQL servers and the rest. They're just hard. Yeah. I would say it's complex apps. So we see this all the time, and I was in government for 20 years, so 18, 20 years, whatever it was. So moving to the cloud and trying to move to a new technology at the same time is what they try to do, and that's that's a recipe for disaster. I want to get off Lotus Notes, so I know I'll migrate it over and set up Lotus Notes on the inside, and I'll try to mic. I mean, you know, I'll set it or go to MongoDB from Lotus Notes in the cloud all at the same time. <laughs> I mean, that's like a recipe for like pain, right? So you, you know, they they want to go to the cloud, and they also want to be able to optimize on open source at the same time. How about get to the cloud first, and then worry about optimization, right? But you try to do too much in your migration, and then suddenly you've got this huge cost, we can't do it, well, it has nothing to do with the cloud. It has to do with the fact that you're, you wanted to go open source at the same time you're trying to go to the cloud. That's a huge mistake. Get to the cloud first, then worry about optimizing in the cloud. All right, good question from the audience. Uh, scratching your head or asking a question? Ah, oh, shoot, <laughs> okay. Sorry, you almost get extra credit points for that, too. 
Hi, my name is Sandesh Patil. I'm, uh, I work for FDIC. Uh, the question I have for the panelists is, uh, are you guys seeing in the government space where agencies are doing uh, IT portfolio rationalization type of a project before they go to the cloud? Or are you seeing more of you know, government agencies coming to you guys and say, hey, please help us. Everybody says we need to go to cloud and we want to be there first. Uh, I mean, any of the any of the panelists have any experiences to share? Yeah, with us having with Smartronics having uh, you know close to eight years of experience of helping federal agencies go into the cloud, we, we see this a lot. Sometimes it gets driven from the top. The CIO mm -hmm. saying, um, "I want to be in the cloud. I want to have my services running in the cloud. Why aren't we doing more um, in the cloud?" Or you'll have more of a, a grassroots movement where you've got people who are looking at newer applications and newer capabilities that they wouldn't be able to do on premise that they would want to, that they would want to uh, be able to utilize in the cloud. We see that particularly around grid computing applications, big data applications, and even now machine learning type applications. Um, what we do is we help them think through, there's, there's a rationalization process that, that needs to happen when you're looking at your when you look at your portfolio moving things to the cloud, your COBOL applications are not going to be high on the list of what mm -hmm. gets moved. Um, there's really very little to change it. They should be high on the list of what you're going to sunset, mm -hmm. what you are going to replatform and rebuild in a newer, more modern uh, capability. Because to be honest, it scares me that something Craig wrote is probably still running somewhere in the government. Mm -hmm. Not that you're necessarily a bad programmer, Craig, but <laughs> things that were written, programmer. things that were written hey, Rob, 20, I got 20 I know bucks on Craig when this whole thing program. goes bad. Tw <laughs> things that were written 15, 20 years ago are still running in your data centers. Um, and they weren't built with that modern security architecture in mind, and they weren't built um, with really thinking of a, you know, a modern platform to be able to provide citizen-centric services. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're seeing a lot of strategy consulting work going into helping organizations prioritize and understand the impact. And then, you know, the six R's with moving into the cloud, re-hosting, re-platform, rewriting, I mean, all of those. Um, you have to think through that. You have to create a decision process on how much money you're going to spend on, on a rewrite or how much you're just going to lift and shift as a design pattern and moving in. And Craig is right. The, the faster you can get something into the cloud um, and stabilized in the cloud, you can then work on the optimization components. But make sure those optimization components are part of your strategy. And in those migration discussions, um, we try to never leave the room without asking but why three times, right? So we need to move a half a million line of code from SVN to, to GitHub Enterprise. Well, but why, <laughs> right? And sometimes when you get to the third but why, the answer is, well, you know, Joe really likes to have all the code in one place. Well, Joe's gonna have to learn to live without a couple hundred lines of his code. <laughs> so really probing on the, the rationale behind the desire to migrate everything, uh, I think is a, obviously a very important step in the process. How many people agree with that last statement? Raise your hand. <laughs> I mean, realistically, that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. it, it is. I mean, people, ha I feel it, right? I mean, we mm -hmm. all feel it. We have to get to the cloud. We have to get to the cloud with everything, right? But why? But, but why? Like, I mean, it's like if we don't get to the cloud, we need to be fired as CIOs and CISOs and, you know, because we clearly are dinosaurs and we don't belong in our jobs. But that's, that's the truth is ask the question, but why? What is the... What is the optimization you're trying to get out of this stuff? Or are you just doing it because the cloud is cool? Mm -hmm. I think we have one minute left. Oh, so, so, sorry to follow up. Um, I think there's, I think there's an underlying problem with uh, technology ownership. Um, I don't know whether I don't. I know this is certainly within the UK government. I don't. I don't know. I, I'm sure. I imagine it's in other industries too. Um, historically, we always thought of technology as a very separate thing that a, that a business or an organisation does. Uh, and I think that a lot of our legacy applications suffer from that. They don't have um, the people who are running the operational businesses within government, you know, your kind of your citizens facing service, they don't have a sense of ownership over their legacy systems. They often see that as being owned by uh, a, a separate technology department or mm -hmm. a kind of light, you know, an operations department or something like that. Um, I think to start to grapple with that problem of, when is the most appropriate time to be moving away from these legacy systems, re whether it's going to be rewriting them or m moving into the cloud in the form that they are. Those are really complex decisions that should be made by people who are close to the operational business that, that is using that leg legacy system day to day because they're the ones feeling the pressure. It could be that your legacy system uh, is working perfectly. What we often see is legacy systems uh, create a huge amount of workarounds because they've become, become impossible to change. And it's actually making the business incredibly expensive to run. 
but the business feels that pressure, not the technology department or the operational department that's running the service. So you need to get ownership right to make, to make the right decisions. That was a good provocative question. Um, are we ending on that one? So we're a minute over now. Does anyone have another question? Or should I thank the panelists? OK. Well, first of all, thank all of you for being a great audience. Victoria, thank you for launching the first question. It started a great discussion. Panelists, thank all of you. This is uh, now we know why and how to future-proof the government. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks,